to prevent adulteration of the final product, all equipment, utensils, and food contact surfaces should be cleaned and sanitized on a daily basis, or more often if needed. Cleaning and sanitizing will only be effective if equipment, utensils, and food contact surfaces are adequately constructed and maintained. The materials used for equipment, utensils, and food contact surfaces should be non-toxic, durable, and non-absorbent. Equipment should be accessible for cleaning and sanitizing or be easily disassembled. Tankers used to transport ingredients or finished product should be considered food contact surfaces and be treated as such. In this section, we will cover basic principles for cleaning and sanitizing in a juice facility. Some related requirements specific to the juice HACCP regulation are also covered in Module 2 of this video, Regulations, Requirements, Prerequisites, and Guidance. What is the difference between cleaning and sanitizing? Even though many people believe them to be the same, they are really two completely separate steps in an effective operation. Cleaning is the removal of organic material and debris from surfaces in preparation for sanitizing. Cleaning involves washing and rinsing and is usually done with detergents and soap and physical scrubbing or agitation, followed by a clean water rinse. Sanitation is the reduction of pathogens and other microbes from surfaces that have already been cleaned using chemicals, heat, or other antimicrobial agents. To achieve adequate sanitation, a thorough cleaning must be completed first. All cleaning and sanitation activities should be documented in writing and be reviewed by a supervisor. This provides for uniformity in these activities and allows for changes if the need comes to light. Most firms utilize a Sanitation Standard Operating Procedure, SSOP, or Master Sanitation Manual that documents in detail how workers are to clean and sanitize, how detergents and sanitizers are to be used and mixed, and how and when tasks should be completed. SSOPs should also detail how and where hoses, shovels, and other utensils are to be used and stored. Safety procedures in the use of all detergents, sanitizers, and other chemicals should also be included. SSOPs should be reviewed by management periodically and be updated if needed. An example of an SSOP is located in the appendices provided with this video. Cleaning and sanitizing activities in a juice processing facility can be Clean in Place, CIP, Sanitize in Place, SIP, or Clean Out of Place, COP. In order to properly conduct cleaning and sanitizing and to maximize the effectiveness of these activities, there is an order in which those activities should be conducted. First, any equipment that needs to be disassembled prior to cleaning should be taken apart by a trained individual. All surfaces should be pre-rinsed with potable water. Next, all surfaces and equipment should be effectively cleaned using hot water, detergent, high pressure, or scrubbing as necessary. Several factors will influence the effectiveness of any cleaning program. The type of detergent used is determined by the type of organic material to be removed. The temperature of the detergent solution and the exposure time are also important, as is the amount of physical scrubbing required and how well the equipment is pre-rinsed. Detergent or soap should be completely rinsed off with potable water. Finally, all surfaces should be sanitized with an approved antimicrobial agent. Commonly used sanitizers include chlorine, chlorine dioxide, or quaternary ammonium. It is important that the level of sanitizer used be adequate to kill the targeted microbe, which could be Salmonella, Listeria, E. coli 0157H7, or any other pathogen. When using chlorine, a level of 100 to 200 parts per million total chlorine is considered acceptable for sanitizing food contact surfaces. It is important to follow label instructions when mixing and applying the sanitizers used. All sanitizer concentration levels should also be checked and recorded by a trained individual. There are several factors to consider when choosing a sanitizer. These factors include equipment or type of surface, temperature of the sanitizing solution, pH and the hardness of the water, as well as sanitizer contact time. Of these factors, water pH is the most important. All sanitizers are most effective when the pH of the water used during sanitizing is kept at a level of 6.5 to 7.0. When in doubt, consult with your chemical suppliers for guidance in the appropriate choice of detergents and sanitizers. 
It is also very important to read all sanitizer and detergent labels. The proper use of chemicals in a juice processing facility should be addressed in your SSOPs or Master Sanitation Manual. These documents should detail what chemicals are used for each job, how and when they are to be mixed and applied, as well as all necessary safety precautions. The SSOP should detail any special clothing that workers should wear during cleaning and sanitizing activities. In facilities that clean in place, CIP, physical controls such as backflow prevention devices should be in place to prevent the adulteration of product with cleaning and sanitizing chemicals. These items should be tested for proper operation and that testing should be documented. Chemical containers should be labeled properly and stored to prevent contamination of juice products. Chemicals must be stored so that they do not contaminate food, ingredients, or packaging. Avoid storing chemicals on food contact surfaces and avoid storing chemicals in empty food or ingredient containers. All chemicals should be used only as the label directs. Always check the labels of all chemicals and do not hesitate to contact your supplier if you have questions. As previously stated, any tankers used in the hauling of ingredients or finished juice products are considered to be food contact surfaces and need to be properly constructed and maintained as well as be cleaned and sanitized like any other equipment in your facility. Unfortunately, many firms contract with outside trucking companies and do not have control of tankers used in the hauling of juice products or ingredients. The facility should require proper documentation from each tanker as to what other products have been previously transported. Cleaning and sanitizing of the tanker should be well documented. Additional guidance on control measures to ensure juice concentrates and certain shelf-stable juices do not become contaminated or recontaminated during bulk transport can be downloaded from FDA's website at www.cfsan.fda.gov under the heading HACCP. What is the importance of acceptable equipment construction and proper cleaning and sanitizing activities? The answer can be summed up in one word, biofilm. Have you heard your dentist talk about removing plaque from your teeth? Have you ever walked across a stream and slipped on slimy rocks? These are both examples of common biofilms. What is biofilm? Biofilm can be defined as a collection of bacterial cells that adhere to surfaces, including food processing equipment, walls, and floors. These bacteria surround themselves with a protective envelope of sugar polymers. Various pathogens, such as Listeria, Salmonella, and E. coli, have been shown to form biofilms that can contaminate food products during processing. Biofilms can be found on the surfaces of product lines, cutting boards, fillers, stainless steel and plastic conveyor systems, and any surface in constant contact with a product. Bacteria in biofilms are hard to find using the normal monitoring techniques. The control of biofilms is difficult, but not impossible. The bacteria in biofilm are protected from sanitizers, disinfectants, and heat treatment. However, biofilms take days to build up. Therefore, timely and proper cleaning and sanitizing can kill the bacteria in the early stages of biofilm formation. Sanitation workers should vigorously follow all cleaning steps pre-rinse, clean, post-rinse, and sanitize every time. The cleaning crew should also vigorously follow the directions for the concentration, temperatures, and contact times for all cleaners and sanitizers. They should ensure that cleaners and sanitizers reach all food contact surfaces. This can be accomplished by inspecting all equipment and surfaces after cleaning, both visually and microbiologically. Appropriately written and followed SSOPs are imperative in controlling biofilm formation. It is also important that your firm replace or repair surfaces that are not smooth and cleanable, such as any rusted, pitted, or deteriorated equipment and food contact surfaces, because rust and deteriorated equipment allows for the growth of bacteria. Rusty equipment is difficult to clean, making formation of biofilms very easy. One way to check on the effectiveness of cleaning and sanitation activities is to conduct environmental monitoring. Swabbing, contact plates, and bioluminescence are commonly used to determine the cleanliness of a surface. 
bioluminescence measurements can give immediate feedback on the effectiveness of a cleaning program by measuring the amount of living cells present. Traditional swabs and contact plates that measure viable microorganisms require 24 to 48 hours for results. Both techniques can play a role in validating your sanitizing program. Firms are encouraged to establish a written environmental monitoring plan that randomly selects hard to clean areas of the facility for swabbing or bioluminescence testing. Cleaning and sanitation workers should understand that monitoring is occurring, but they should not necessarily know what specific areas are being monitored at any point in time. Firms may conduct these monitoring activities in-house, or they may choose to hire an outside lab. If monitoring in-house, proper procedures should be followed and all monitoring activities should be documented and verifiable. Monitoring methods should be chosen to provide accurate results in as quickly a time as possible. Outside labs should be certified by the proper authorities to ensure they are qualified to conduct monitoring activities. Check with your local or state authorities, suppliers, and technical magazines for acceptable laboratories in your area. Another important factor in the safe processing of juice is pest control and exclusion. Pests can and do contaminate foods and transmit disease. Effective control and exclusion should be a priority. Pest control and exclusion can be separated into two categories, physical controls and chemical controls. Exclusion is the practice of preventing the entrance of vermin or pests into your facility. Physical controls include items such as window screens, screen doors, proper weather stripping of all doors, plastic curtains, and air fans at all doorways. Even the practice of keeping all doors closed serves as a physical control. All insects, rodents, and birds, as well as domestic animals, should be excluded from the facility at all times. Proper removal of waste products from the facility, removing old, unused equipment, and maintaining the exterior grounds all serve to remove possible vermin attractants. Keeping a cleared space around the exterior perimeter of your buildings is also helpful. Other practices in the day-to-day -day operation of your facility can serve as effective pest control practices. Proper storage of ingredients, finished products, and packaging, as well as the timely cleanup of spills and the proper lighting of the facility all help in discouraging vermin infestations. Chemical controls consist of the use of pesticides, traps, and baits in and around the facility. It is suggested that you employ a licensed pest control operator or contract with an outside firm in order to conduct these activities. Any chemicals used in pest control applications should be acceptable for use in a food processing facility and their application or storage should not contaminate foods, ingredients, or food packaging. All pest control activities should be routinely monitored and recorded. Proper monitoring will show the effectiveness of those activities or it will point out areas that need more attention. Remember, chemical controls can only be effective when used in conjunction with well-established physical controls. Your primary goal is to exclude all pests.